All right, what's going on, everybody? Isaac, <clears throat> redo. Let's do this again. All right, redo. Hey, what's up, everybody? Isaac here with Civil Engineering Academy. Excited that you're here with me again. Thanks for checking this out. Leave us a comment if you haven't already. And hey, share it with a friend because uh, sharing is caring, right? Well, I'm excited today. Today is a great episode. I bring on Dirk Bondi, who is my brother's absolute hero. He is all things post-tension concrete. But Dirk Bondi is a professor, and he actually teaches at Cal Poly State and UCLA and has his own business called Seneca, and is just awesome. Uh, also a pilot. So mix all that together. I don't know how he does it all, but he does. And we have a really enjoyable conversation about um, engineers that teach. Uh, maybe you want to go into that arena. Uh, we talk about starting a business. Maybe you want to go in that arena. Or maybe you want to do both like Dirk and uh, maybe how to balance all of that in your own life. So we have a really enjoyable conversation. Uh, Dirk is very down to earth and we just enjoy his teaching style. We'll also link to his YouTube channel. He has some great videos out there uh, talking about post tension concrete and it's good stuff. So I think you're really going to enjoy this again and uh, it's going to be coming up right after this. See you in a minute. All right, I have Dirk Bondi with me today. Dirk, welcome to the Civil Engineering Academy podcast. How are things going? Great. Great to be here. I'm, this is my first podcast ever, and so I'm very excited. Awesome. Hey, I'm Brad. also joined by my brother, Mark, who thinks you're the, the world's greatest structural engineer. And here. so I wanted to bring him on to, uh, to help <laughs> with some questions. So uh, I guess as we... I love Dirk. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> I wonder how long we were going to get into this before we professed our love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, I guess let's start right at the, I guess, a little bit at the beginning. And that's basically how, you know, your history of structural engineering. Why, why did you go that route in your life? How did you end up being a structural engineer? That's a great question. And, and here's the, the truth of the answer is, uh, my parents split up when I was about eight years old and divorced a couple years later. Um, I like the view where you guys are there, but is that possible or we have to look at me? <laughs> we can do this any way you want. There. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to you guys, but and do whatever is the best. Um, anyway, back to my story. Um, so my mother remarried and then got divorced, but we moved up to Northern California. So my father, who I don't know if you know, he's a pretty famous structural engineer. Uh, he was a big part of Atlas pre-stressing and, and originally started at T.Y. Lynn. Uh, he's a big name in Southern California engineering. But I had a distant relationship with him after my parents split up. And I'll be honest, things didn't go so well for me in, in high school. I was making bad decisions, uh, not getting good grades, and absolutely nothing to brag about. And, and my mother had pretty much had it with me by my junior year and said, you're going to go live with your father and get your head straight. And that's exactly what happened. For I lived with him for the summer. I saw the lifestyle he led. I saw him as a happy person and, and he went, he allowed me to go to work with him. He had kind of a, a communal office. He, it was just him and his business partner and a draftsman, but they allowed friends of theirs who'd come from Atlas pre-stressing, which had exploded. And they, they came in and worked in some office spaces. So I got to see a lot of structural engineers talk with them. They were funny people. I think engineers are some of the most clever, humorous people I've ever met. Um, flies in the face of what, you know, as I said, as we're depicted in television and in the movies, we're usually kind of nerdy people. But uh, the funniest people I know are, are engineers. Anyway, I just like the lifestyle. He took me to his job sites and I was fascinated with it. And I saw what what they did. And I saw people being very happy. And I had been working at a car wash up in Modesto. Um, that wasn't a real happy place to be. I, and I said, to answer your question, I said, I want to do this. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but 
I like the environment. I like happy people. My dad came home happy. And uh, I said, that that's for me. So what does it take? And he said, well, go back, get good grades. I got straight A's from that point forward. Um, went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and was very lucky to get in. I could never have gotten in today with the grades that I had, but luckily back in 1983, you pretty much just applied. And as long as you were the minimum standards, they let you in. Um, <laughs> did well there and went on to, uh, I got accepted at both uh, Berkeley and Stanford for graduate school and ended up going to Berkeley with, which was a really great program with really intense professors at that time. So that's great. That's a, that's a great, great story. So if we fast forward to today, you're teaching now at Cal Poly and UCLA, and you have a business, Seneca Structural Engineering. So how do you manage all, all of that? And maybe give us a little flavor of what Seneca specializes in. Well, I worked at, at Engelkirk's office for seven years, and they're a general structural engineering firm. They did the, the Getty on the Hill down in, in Los Angeles and really some major structures. I did a lot of steel, probably did more steel than anything else and wood and concrete and post-tension concrete. I decided at some point I was going out on my own. You know, you kind of hit the point that you're not making enough money and you think you're you actually think you're better than the people who are making more money in the firm and you have a decision to make. And uh, I decided to, to roll the dice on myself and went out and tried to be a general structural engineer. And I, and I did, I was working for property companies and putting, I was taking like you do whatever work you can get. I was adding mezzanines into warehouse buildings and putting eyebrows on converted warehouses to offices, and whatever anybody wanted me to do. But with my last name being Bondi, it was somewhat inevitable. It's apparently in my DNA that I was going to gravitate towards post-tensioning as a specialty. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and I had my father who was still practicing when I started my own firm and his relationships. And it, it just evolved to where it made more sense and, and a lot more money to just do post-tension concrete. I, I learned quickly that there are very few people who know how to do it and very few people who know how to do it right. So if I could just specialized. get into that, um, I'd have a nice, nice firm. And I, I stole a guy that I was working with from Engelkirk's office and Brian Allred, and he does a lot of webinars with SK Ghosh and he likes teaching also. We both, we both enjoy teaching. So um, it's just been he and I since uh, 1998. And like I said, we started off general, but it didn't take too long to become just post-tension specialists. So you started your own company. What happened to your father's company? Um, <laughs> Was there an opportunity for you to just jump into that one or you wanted well, to do your own? So I think I'll just go on my own. I, I think I can do this. And it was probably the best thing because, uh, I've never worked for my dad. He's always been someone I relied upon and could go to and, and did use contacts. But it was when I went out on my own, I went out on my own. And, wow. and like I said, I was working for mostly for property companies doing PML analyses and whatever it took to pay the bills. So can I ask you, what are some things I guess starting a business has taught you that maybe you haven't never learned in school? Oh, <laughs> I'm well, sure see, there's a bunch of, the of them. I like to teach is because I talk about those things that nobody in in the you know university levels usually willing to talk about. And uh, uh, there's so many things. There's so many things about relationships, and I have to become a good architect. I have to actually become a good electrician and plumber. I have to know what other people are doing on the project. Not quite as well as they do, but I have to know how we are going to interface and help them. And that's a tremendous benefit to anybody who, if you're just good at engineering, you're, you're going to be limited. You have to start getting good at, at being an architect and being a parking consultant. I've actually gotten to the point where people have tried to hire me to be the parking consultant, and I have to tell them I'm not. <laughs> I'm not an architect. I'm not qualified to do that, even though probably can do a lot of it 
Yeah, Dirk, I, I see a lot of that. I've, I've been in post-tension concrete for over 20 years. I've probably built, I don't know, over 100 post-tension projects in my in my career. And, uh, and, and I get into some of the same situations where I'll get uh, design teams and stuff that'll, that'll come in and, and want me to be the consultant. <laughs> you know, and I got to step no, back. I got to do a lot of things. Yeah, I'm yeah. I you to do it. <laughs> oh, you know, I know how big a parking stall is. I can, I can lay this out, but we really need to get <laughs> right. an architect that can, that, that can look at things at a 30,000 foot level and, and make sure we're all code compliant on everything. So. Yeah, that's that's an important aspect. Yeah, I, I do tell my students, and, and I love teaching because I love those young, sharp minds, and they're they're so eager to learn, and they really want to hear what it's like. And I can still remember my first day working at Engelkirk's office. I mean, I remember how nervous I was, how much I realized I didn't know. <laughs> that's terrifying. You know, and that's coming out of Berkeley with a graduate degree, thinking I'm pretty hot stuff. First day at the desk, it's like, I don't know anything. <laughs> it's exactly so right. And so I yeah. can relate to these students. You know, when I get them, they're seniors in the in the spring quarter or they're graduate students. I usually, at both UCLA and Cal Poly, have about a 50-50 mix of, of undergraduates and graduate students. But they're all right on the brink of going out to get a job. And they're they're terrified. I remember what it's like, and I love talking to them about it. Well, um, I guess as we talk about post tension structural concrete, for those that don't know, because we have a wide range uh, uh, in our audience, but but those that don't know, where is post tension structural concrete mainly found? Where is it used? To be honest with you, it's everywhere now. And that's, um, it's exploding. It's every building type you can think of can be done in post-tension concrete. And the more structural steel gets expensive and more steel gets expensive, the more popular post-tension concrete has become. I mean, it's just overwhelming. People ask me, why do you teach and tell everybody how you do what you do? And I say, because there's so much work out there that we won't be stepping on each other's toes. I just, it's in my benefit for you to do it right. But we'll, Parking structures are big. Hotels, almost every hotel you'll stay in that's over four stories will be post-tension concrete. Um, office buildings, condominiums, apartments, assisted living facilities. We've done medical office buildings. Uh, to be honest with you, the, the invention of the stud rail, the, the stud rail for punching shear, that opened up a whole world for us. When we could get away from having that big blob of concrete, that, com that column cap, which architects absolutely hated. When we got away from that, that opened up really every single building type to us. Anything that was built in steel on a 30 by 30 grid can be built in post-tension concrete in that same grid. And our, I'm really selling like a, a salesman because I am, you know, our total structural system depth will be about eight inches, the whole thing. Whereas with steel, that just their depth, their metal filled decks is six and a quarter. And then they've got to get to the beam itself. And yeah. you know, we're we're talking two feet of floor of difference. And that Yeah, made, Dirk, Dirk, I've been involved with projects like that where we've made relative comparisons, where we've taken structural steel buildings that are designed with structural steel, created an equivalent post-tensioned building. Same number of floors, same number, you know, same space, same footprint. And, you know, we save, you know, 50, 60 feet on the top of the building and they save a bunch of building skin costs because we get all the same mechanical equipment. All Everything is all there, all the space that the, the end user needs, the owner. But we do it a lot more, you know, economically that way and, and, and not only saving in uh, building skin costs, but, you know, there's there's a lot of other uh, aspects of structural concrete, the, the thermal mass, you know, that uh, that's involved with it, that, you know, a lot so of air people... conditioning the building is cheaper. It's just a smaller volume. Uh, like you said, the skin. That all that concrete, that thermal mass, like a big battery. Right. And so. You don't get the big swings in temperature as the sun comes up and cooks the building and then goes down. 
Um, and so that, that, that causes less demand on the mechanical system. So I'm sure you've seen some of those things get realized in your, in your career. <clears throat> it's hard for us to weigh less than a steel building, but for any other type of concrete building, we post-tension slabs can take out a couple inches of slab mass. Uh, that lightens the seismic loads, yeah. lightens the column loads, lightens the foundation loads. And the savings just reverberate through the entire building. And people really, you know, we have a really flat floor and it doesn't bounce. And, you know, it, <laughs> I just go on and on and on. But yeah, that sounds really nice. People used to be terrified of post-tension concrete. They, did you know that I teach in both the University of California and the California State, you know, Cal Poly's Cal State and UCLA's UC system. Both of those school systems for decades, it was illegal to build post-tension concrete for any of their buildings on their campuses. They were absolutely terrified of it. Um, I now sit on the seismic review board for the Cal State University, and they, not too long ago, just decided to allow post-tension concrete, except for parking structures. They would allow that, but any of the dormitories that were being built, they couldn't be post-tension concrete. It was just the fear that was out in the industry about putting these very large forces purposely. Who would do that? <laughs> into a building. We're against that. We want small people. We cross our fingers that we'll never get any of the loads that we designed for and try to sleep at night. And you crazy people go out and actually put these enormous loads into the <laughs> nuts. Yeah, you're nuts. <laughs> well, why don't you, uh, while we're talking about this, what maybe what are some of the common issues that you see with post tension concrete? It definitely sounds like the benefits are uh innumerable but what are some of the issues that you see with post tension well we talk about that all the time and that's the fun stuff uh brian my my business partner loves to do those webinars for for sk gauche and throw out the pictures of exploding concrete and and that you know unfortunately those things do happen you you need a good structural engineer to design it correctly and you need a very qualified contractor to build it correctly and if anybody gets cavalier on their part, you can't trick post-tension concrete. It will find your mistake, it will find the flaw, and it will pronounce it to the whole world. So, um, we, no hiding. We, yeah, there's no hiding. So you really do need to know what you're doing. And that's one of the things I teach my students is, in every other material, you can over-design. You can put, it, you know, 18 by, by 35 can be a, a 21 by 44, no harm, no foul. You can always make the wood size two inches deeper, use the, the deeper glue lamb. In post-tension concrete, more is usually worse than less. If you're going to err, you almost want to err on the, the less side of post-tension, not the more side. Because once you, you start putting in more than you need, you have the restraint to shortening. The building starts squeezing and pulling itself in too much. And you can have the overbalancing effect of literally shooting the concrete up in the air. Hey, uh, Dirk, this, this goes into your cowbell story, does it? More cowbell. Exactly. That, that is that's a what, cowbell story. That's, that's how I, I communicate with the younger generation you know, <laughs> through Saturday Night Live skits. Um, but that's exactly it. I, I teach my students it's not more cowbell. In, uh, yeah. <laughs> in every other material, every other aspect of structural engineering, not in post tensioning. We're we're the less cowbell uh, group. <laughs> yeah, Dirk Dirk tells a story about him uh, being up at night, late, and watching old Saturday Night Live skits. And I think that was one from uh, who was in that skit? What uh, that you, you you talk well, about? Will Ferrell. Uh, the Will Ferrell. This one in there. Um, uh, I'm blanking on on who the other one was. Uh, it actually says more cowbell. A uh, walk-in. Uh, Christopher, Christopher Walken. Walken. That's walk absolutely in. right. Yes. I yeah. should know that a little bit better. I get emails from around the world all the time about cowbells and people sending me pictures of cowbells. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Kid, I think Christopher Walken and, and Will Ferrell and and a few others. Um, and no matter how bad the music's getting, it's always more cowbell. We need a louder. <laughs> I need more cowbell. So, 
Yeah. I need to yeah. go watch that one, apparently. <laughs> that, that one, the, the students have always related to. Uh, yeah, great. I like that one. I put something on the final, usually, about cowboys, too. Just <laughs> make sure they're watching the video. <laughs> well, great. speaking of students, I have a question for you about them. So if, if, if someone was just starting their journey into the structural engineering world, I guess what advice would you have for them? Uh, I give this advice a lot. I mean, be patient. You know, they, the students are going to go in and they're going to look at, they're all interested in how much money they're going to make. And they're usually disappointed when they see what the structural engineer makes right out of school compared to their construction management friends, their computer software friends, their almost any other friends. And I tell them, you know, you've got to understand we're, we're more like doctors than than anything else. We, you'll graduate with a degree and my son's in medical school. So I make this comparison analogy, but that's really just a license to start learning. And like I said, I was talking with you guys, I think before we hit uh, record that my first day on the job after being a graduate from Berkeley, thinking I was hot stuff, I was terrified. And I realized how much I didn't know. And, and the states that license us know that they know you're not ready. So that's why it takes two years to even be allowed to sit for the professional engineer's exam. And then it takes three years after passing that exam to even be able to sit to be a licensed structural engineer. And they're not just being mean to us. It is five years of true learning um, that it takes before you are really qualified. And that's really just as you're getting to be really qualified to go out and make decisions on your own and really represent yourself as, as a person who can be trusted by the state, the architects, the owners, that, that you, know, you can really do this. And at that point, I've always said they should do a you know salary check <laughs> on people five years into their industries, not out of school. You know, and if you if you've worked hard and you've learned a lot. You're, you're much more marketable after you get those two licenses. So that's that's my advice to somebody going into it. Um, you know, that's it's a great advice. World. It's, you, you get to learn about all kinds of different materials. And I, I always tell my students to try to go to one of the larger firms, learn how to do everything, because that's how you're going to pass those exams. Your, your main focus should just be passing the exams for your you know, they think five years is forever. It took them four years to get through college. And it seemed like forever. And five years is just, oh, so long. And, you know, I'm, I'm 57 years old. That's nothing. <laughs> a tiny amount of time. There's so much time after that. And it goes by so much faster when you're out of school, too. I just, yeah. just so you know, like, as soon as you start working, years fly by. And, and I tell them it's easier too. It's never going to be harder than it was in school. It's yeah. It's you're going to learn some tough things, but most of your days are are more enjoyable. You're learning, but um, it's nothing like being in graduate school or something like that. And yeah, seven days a week, always having exams and projects hanging over your head. You, you actually get to go home at five thirty or so and and go enjoy yourself. And it'll all be waiting for you on your desk when you come back at eight the next day. <laughs> Right. <laughs> or a couple phone calls in the night. Who knows? Yeah. Now that we have email constantly on our phones, it's, it's a little harder to walk away. Well, uh, what's your, uh, um, I wanted to ask your opinion uh, or get your thoughts on the difference between grouted and ungrouted post tension concrete systems and uh, where they're used. Uh, grouted is used in communist countries. <laughs> probably gonna have to edit that out. Uh, I get lots of emails from people all over the world. Some of them are coming. Uh, I love everybody. Uh, we talked about how everybody was scared of post tension concrete, and it was that fear, in my humble opinion, that le that leads to still to this day needing to grout uh, post tensioning. Post, that, it's the worst thing that can happen to it, to be honest with you. Unbonded post-tensioning is almost impossible to fail. And we learned that in earthquakes in California, Northridge. 
the these the tendons can bend down to the next level without breaking. They saved lives and in ways they were never intended to, in ways they were never designed to. But as soon as you grout those tendons, then they, you know, the whole idea is to make them like rebar, have strain compatibility, have them bonded, so that in the unlikely and strange event that, that a plumber comes by and cores right through them, it'll be like rebar where they redevelop themselves within so many feet. But by grouting and making it strain compatibility, all that, you now introduce the potential to rupture that steel, just like um, mild reinforcement can. And it, it takes away the, the, the greatest benefits of post-tensioning, which is being unbonded, being almost unable to fail. I mean, as long as somebody doesn't core right through the tendon, it's, it will be there forever. You know, so now encapsulated, uh, this code requires, since uh, 2014 has required full encapsulation for all building post-tensioning. So it's completely isolated now from the environment. You pour water mm -hmm. over it, you, you know, salt water, nothing can get to it anymore if it's, if it's installed properly. And it's it's almost indestructible unless right. somebody pours right through it. But but my argument has always been you can't design assuming somebody's going to do something stupid. You you wouldn't want anybody just Swiss cheesing your mild reinforced deck either. I mean that's just as disastrous. So um, that's Makes the sense. only reason that I ever hear for grouting. Post okay. Well, I feel like I've asked a lot of questions, Mark. What do you got on your plate? You maybe you got a few you want to explore. You want to ask? Dirks, he, as I've mentioned, he's he's very grounded, kind of kind of practical type engineer. He's worried about constructability and those types of things. If I can speak for you, um, you do better. So, than I do. I'm thinking back, uh, you know, going through your courses and some of the things that uh, that you've talked about. And one of the things I love uh, is your your approach that, you know, you talk about, um, you know, moment distribution and dealing with indeterminate structures and the old way of doing things are still valid. You know, these days in finite element analysis and we can create these fancy 3D you know, structural models and they're fabulous. But um, if you don't have those core skills of, you know, moment distribution and, and to be able to check those, those, uh, those, those software, those big fancy software programs, um, then you, you can't like, it's, it's like a black box, right? You're just running input into this black box and it's cranking things out. How do you have a feel for what what it's telling you unless you you can use some of these uh, I, I, I like to call them old school structural approaches um, to gauge whether whether you're getting adequate output from from all of your input how do you how do you gauge yourself you know no absolutely I um, you know the interesting thing with covid is I, I'm an outsider in the universities they to be honest they honestly they don't want me there. I'm I don't really belong. I'm a practicing engineer who steps into their world, and and I it I know well. <laughs> I definitely right. know that I'm not yeah. big fans. And one interesting thing about COVID was I never got invited to the faculty meetings until COVID. <laughs> then everybody was on these links, and they would send it to me too, so I would get in on them. And they hated having me in there because. They want, you know, the next greatest thing, the next greatest software. Let's let's get rid of, and you know that most schools got rid of pre-stressed concrete as a time. It just wasn't fun enough. It wasn't uh, interesting enough. Uh, I don't know what the reason was, but both Cal Poly and UCLA had canceled their pre-stressed concrete class. I started teaching at Cal Poly two years after they canceled their pre-stressed concrete class. UCLA in 2011 hired me. And I didn't realize at the time that they were hiring me to teach the very last time they were going to offer pre-stressed concrete. It was kind of uh, poetic to have me. My dad had taught that course in the 90s. And they asked, John Wallace asked me to teach it 
And like I said, I didn't know it was the last time. In the seventh week, he met me in the hall and said, well, thanks for, for doing this. If we ever teach this class again, we'll call you. And I, I was kind of devastated. But anyway, to go back to the topic, they have me on these. And I, I just step in and say, no, it's about fundamentals. We're, you know, it, it was hand drawing and then it was ink drawing and then it was AutoCAD was the new thing. And there was something before AutoCAD. And, and you know, now it's Revit, but I said, we're constantly going through, it's three dimensional finite element. But if you look at the building, it's always the same building at the end. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> exactly. Just, don't know, was that a hand-drawn building? Was that a Revit building? Was that done in AutoCAD? Was that right. a finite element? Right. It's always the same thing. The eight inch post tension slab always goes 30 feet. <laughs> right. <laughs> By 35 always does the same thing. The flex right. the same way. Um, right. So I'm, I couldn't be more with you. It's always, especially in the universities, about the fundamentals. Just get down to the brass tacks. And then as long as you understand those, any software change that comes later, any, any way of presenting the model, uh, drawing it, you'll be able to to adapt because you understand the fundamentals. Yes. And I, I love that. I love that, that teaching from you that you, you try to convey that to your students that get, get that fundamental, that foundation, make sure that that's solid because all these other things are nice, fancy tools and they'll help you be, you know, more efficient with your design potentially but you got to have those foundations to actually, you know, know what you're doing. Um, Absolutely. Which, that, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> which leads me to, yeah, asking you to to talk about your uh, your pig farmer story because it re- it goes right into that concept. <laughs> yeah, no, it was just, I was in a mood that day. I just... <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know I was going to bring up all this fun stuff. No, I have to remember back when I was... No, it's just basically the mob mentality, you know, that the pigs can run and 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 forage for themselves and they're strong and and um farmers learned how to uh to tame them basically by putting up one fence and giving them some food and after a while the, the pigs on their you know their path would divert off and uh, and eat some of that. Farmer then puts up the next, you know, this analogy's been used for uh, politics typically, but I adapted it to structural. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Basically taking a wild, strong uh, group that fully functional on their own and teaching them to be complacent and need what they never needed naturally. And, and it's taming of the, the wild pigs and eventually the pigs like the free food they don't care that the fourth wall got put up the fourth fence got put up and and they make a choice to just stay and and wallow in their own filth i think as i say <laughs> that's right get fat and forget how to hunt to forage they, all their muscle goes to fat and they're happy and they're okay with it but they get slaughtered right <laughs> they end up getting slaughtered that way <laughs> And that, you know, that's the analogy I've used to the software developers are trying to just get everybody to do the same thing, not think about it, not think about the fundamentals. If you can go to a three day seminar on how one of these very sophisticated programs is is um, taught, they only teach you how to use the program. They're not teaching you the fundamentals of what the program does. And there's almost no access to it. And, you know, I'm. I've got a lot of opinions, um, but I don't think they want you to know. I think it benefits most of the software developers for you not to know what it is that their software is doing. They want you to trust them implicitly and just get to the point that you don't really need to know what it's what it's doing. Plus, I, I think that commoditizes engineering, Dirk. Don't you think that that has a, an effect of like, Making engineering kind of a commodity rather than a well, absolutely. I mean, I, I I depress my students when I tell them this, but I say when when I started, you know, I worked at Engelker's office. We had forty two people when I started. There was one room, and it had three computers in it. It had a Mac and two PCs, and you had to make the decision to stand outside the door and wait for whoever was on those computers to get off <laughs> to decide to go in and model and do whatever you needed to do, but you're 
alternate choice was to do it by hand or do it with the steel manual or do it with some charts back at your desk. And you had to weigh that. Um, but you always knew what you were doing. And we also didn't trust the computers. They had bugs in them. They were written by other structural engineers. They weren't, there was no computer science majors really back then um, writing these things. It, it was one engineer writing it for another. My father wrote PT data and then just sold it to his friends. And, and that's who used it. And they would call up and say, hey, something weird happens when I put a cantilever in, you know, and <laughs> you're going to need to focus on that. This isn't right. And, and that, you know, picking up the phone and talking about bugs, and that's how software got better, got right. refined. Things right. are all different now. I mean, things are. So how has, has things got, do you still do peer reviews where you have to review other engineers' work? And is, has, yes. has peer review makes best? me suicidal. <laughs> Get worse because of this. The ease of uh, of using the the package software that's out there. I just ask in our peer reviews, and so does Brian. We do a lot. We work for the city of Newport Beach. We work for the city of San Francisco, and we do peer reviews on on theirs and others. And I just ask simple questions. I'll see a column with a you know the same loading, the same tributary area, the same spans. One column has five number sixes over it, and the other one has fourteen number sixes over. And I just asked the question, why? What's different? The loading doesn't look different. The spans don't look different. The tributary is not any different. Right. And all I get back is we have verified the input with the computer program. It's all correct. <laughs> no idea right. where the reinforcement comes from. Is it minimum right. strength? Is it over? Right. Is, right. And it's just so frustrating to just try to ask a simple question. Right. Why is this not like that? Right. <laughs> well, I know you got in any, like uh, I'm sure you've served as an expert witness where you have to come up against somebody like that that's uh, produced a, a another fancy thing that makes me suicidal. But yes, I I have done that too. <laughs> yeah, I you know it's kind of funny. I've got funny stories, and I do tell my students that that someone comes in and they're cocky chest out. They been running the most sophisticated uh, software, finite element. And then they, I come in with PT data, you know, it's just doing a strip method and I can do everything in PT data by hand and do. And then somebody brings in the simplified ADAPT um, also doing the same thing. My dad and, and Bijan were competitors, you know, they, they did yeah. ADAPT in Northern California and PT data was Southern California. Yeah. It was doing the same thing. And we both, ADAPT and PT Data, came up with the same thing. And the sophisticated person came up with something totally different. And we start explaining why exactly we got our answers. And we ask simple questions. Like I said, why is that 14 number fives and not the same six number five? And you see the sweat just start. <laughs> These are too. Right. And, you know, we smell a little blood in the water and we start asking <laughs> questions. You know, this doesn't look right right here. Where would you find that? And they've got the stats about but they're like, well, it would it would take me a while to figure out that. And even the mediator will say, well, we'll take a break while you look this up. We'll go get them. <laughs> come back and they can't find anything. They don't know how the computer runs. They yeah. don't look for anything. And the mediators have said, and this happened twice, just you don't seem to understand your own program. So I'm going to go with these other people that seem to implicitly understand theirs. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's why I love your approach, Dirk, because you got that, <laughs> that practical approach and, and I don't know, just going back to the old school ways. And I know uh, PT data and some of these other things, you know, still serve as tools for you, but the old ways were not, <laughs> they're not outdated. They, they teach you those fundamentals that you've got to know. You know, so I think that's a really cool thing. Fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a really cool thing that you try to teach. And I'm sure that drives a lot of your desire to, to help students and, and your desire to teach is to convey some of these important concepts like that. Well, I mean, I, I start getting in my own head that I'm the only one doing it. I'm sure I'm not, but <laughs> trying to find somebody else that's just. Well, I'm. Yeah. <laughs> I try to do that kind of stuff in my practice. So you've we've converted engineers who go in and I, I really would always hope that 
the engineers would make time to try to go into a university and teach, especially when you can start doing it through the internet now too. I think that is the next great thing for for teaching for universities. There's it shouldn't be limited to who can get inside the brick and mortar walls to teach the classes anymore. And mm-hmm. um, that brings me to another question. Just with all that you are doing, if if engineers want to be teachers, do you have tips around? people that want to get into that arena, or it sounds like what you're suggesting is that everyone should maybe test that water and, and help, help the next generation. So I think buying an airplane and becoming a pilot helps. <laughs> That's what you've done. <laughs> I did. No, I, I saw that question coming up, so I know it's coming, but um, that, you know, I was up at, at a fundraiser at Cal Poly in 2014, and they had canceled their pre-stress concrete class. And and we talked about Bajan Alami. Florian Barth was his partner in BFL and, and ADAPT. Florian's son, Florian, also named, uh, was in the graduate program at Cal Poly. And at this fundraiser, Florian Sr. said to Al Estes, the department head at at Cal Poly's RE department said, I'm really frustrated. My son's going to graduate from Cal Poly with a master's degree and never once take pre-stressed concrete. And Al's face kind of went white, you know, and I don't know, I, it was kind of an out-of-body experience. I heard somebody say, I'll teach him how to do it. <laughs> and that, that was me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'll, I'll fly up. I'll fly up and teach Florian, how to do pre-stressed concrete. And like I said, it was an out-of-body experience. I don't know what I was talking about. I hadn't put it all together yet, but I was in this, you know, conversation and I ended up, and Al said, okay. And it got him out of an uncomfortable situation with Florian. Florian Bart, by the way, is the biggest donor that their Cal Poly's RT department has ever had. So they want to keep him happy. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they they didn't pay me, uh, which is fine. I flew up every Friday. It turned out I had nine students because students are smart. When they realize that one kid's dad, who's a famous structural engineer, thinks he should take a class, they should probably take the same class. (laughs) So I ended up having nine nine graduate students, which was almost their entire department, I think. And we didn't have a classroom. uh, So we just kind of met out on the lawn until the weather started changing. Then we went to the grad lab and kind of took that over. But I taught these students pre-stressed concrete, the same class I'd been teaching at UCLA. But they used the videos that, uh, I've got a whole video story if you want to hear it later, but they they used the videos that um, I posted on YouTube and they did really well. And this was back when Al said, nobody can learn by videos on YouTube. That's just, there's no way that's going to be successful. COVID came along and everybody proved that wrong. But that was back 2014 before COVID. And these students really got it. And and they went back and said, this class needs to be taught. And I've been teaching it every year since then. Hmm. That's awesome. But I do fly up. I do meet them in person. I do think that's important. You you can do some of the lectures online, but you've got to have some face-to-face with them. Yeah, yeah. It can be Zoom. It can be like this, but but nothing's better than standing in front of them. It's also nothing's more terrifying, too. Um, You stand in front of a group of really sharp students. And between Cal Poly and UCLA, they get the best young minds in engineering that there is. And, you know, for an old guy to stand up there and try to go toe to toe and and they, they smell blood in the water, too, when it's out there. Oh, yeah. Anytime you stand in. Anytime you stand in front of a group of your peers, it's intimidating, isn't it? And yeah. Well, young, sharp minds. And these guys, like you said, these guys and girls. In fact, my, my Cal Poly class was 23 people and 16 of them were female, which is absolutely fantastic. They're so sharp. And they've gone the whole four years. So they're all tuned up. Their brain, they've just done all five quarters of calculus and thermodynamics. And I mean, they are really firing on all cylinders. And I've got two cylinders left, you know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> But to have to stand up in front of them and go toe to toe and answer their questions. What if this? And why don't you do that? And you sure you're right about this? And, you know, you're fielding that. And um, yeah. 
it's great. There's that's my main, <laughs> you know, it's great to teach young people and be a practicing engineer and they appreciate that. But it's the benefits to you for doing that, for keeping yourself sharp. Um, you'll never there's nothing you can do other than maybe computer programming to keep your brain and your, your mind nimble and sharp, like teaching a class. You have to anticipate everything. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's awesome. Great tips. Uh, boy, I think we could go on and on. I don't know, but oh, we might have to book him for another session. I can, <laughs> we'll to yeah. Let's sign me up. I'll have to do another one. This is fun. This has been really enjoyable to just kind of get your ideas about um, just a wide variety of topics. So we appreciate you coming on and doing this with us. Um, what's a, what's a good way for our audience to connect with you, Dirt? Uh, I, I enjoy getting emails from all over the world. People are watching my, I, I just got told by YouTube, I've exceeded 10,000 um, followers on, on YouTube for my videos, which Ah, that made me feel great because I've never advertised it. It has to be word of mouth. Nobody, yeah. um, I mean, they have to stumble across it or be told about it. it um, but Dirk at SenecaStructural.com. That is the best way. Perfect. Seneca spelled S-E-N-E-C-A. Structural. Hopefully everybody watching this can spell that. <laughs> uh, Engineers Dirk, don't know how to spell yeah. sometimes. So I'm happy to answer emails. I, I get them all the time. To be honest with you, I get them from so many places all over the world that my business partner, Brian's got a friend who works in the FBI and says, um, you know, he's probably being monitored right now. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you getting emails from Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia? And all these yeah. Uh, you okay. might get some more now. We'll make sure yeah, to link I that in our it. show notes and, <laughs> and your YouTube channel too. So people can learn what you do and enjoy some of the material you have. So Dirk, we appreciate you jumping on. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank it. you, Dirk. Yep. It's been fun. All right. We'll talk to you later. Day. Okay. See you.